Hi, I'm James Lewis, former chair of the State of Michigan Libertarian Party. And I'm going to give you a little bit about who I am, why I'm who I am, and how actually I've chosen to kind of reject the modern model of what society tells you you have to do to conform. And it's okay. When I was a child, um, I came up and I know I'm familiar with Michigan and blue collar towns, but I grew up in Hazel Park, Michigan. Quiet blue town, blue collar town where, you know, it was union shop guys down the street and they all had their jobs and, and you know, things like that. And I'm sure you can get the picture. Well, my household wasn't the normal household even in that town. Um, I had parents that were, well, they were rebel rousers by society standards. Uh, my mom, a former stripper and drug dealer, and my father, mentally nuts, like certifiable. So I had an abusive, destructive home. Now, when you're a child, you don't understand the damage that's being done around you, let alone uh, the chaos that's being created. So what you have to do then as you grow, as you're growing, you have to actually become aware of the damage that you're inflicting on yourself. By the time I was 15 years old, growing up in welfare and all the chaos of my house, I had amassed a body structure of over 600 pounds in weight and size. And I was suicidal. I was ready to check out. Done. So I understand these kids today who are wanting to throw in the towel because they think it's, it, it's all over and there's nothing better. But I'm going to tell you, there is better. There's a lot better, but you've got to take and find it in yourself and make a choice. It's all about a choice, and that's all we have is choices. Don't let anybody ever tell you different. It's all choices. So when I was a child, and I was ready to call it quits at 15, and I had my suicide plan all laid out, this teacher reached out to me, Kathy McKenney. To this day, I've lost track of her. Bless her heart and soul, wherever she sleeps and lays. She introduced me to this guy, Leo Bascalia. Leo Biscaglia preaches self-love. It's the first thing he talks about above anything else. And he says, there's nobody on this whole wide world that's going to love you more than you love yourself. Sounds kind of narcissistic, but he doesn't mean it that way. He means you got to value your self-worth above all other things you're going to encounter in your life so you don't abuse yourself, so you don't let somebody create an environment that lets you become 600 pounds because you don't care. That's the kind of stuff that needs to be addressed when you're a kid, and it's not easy. Especially if you don't have role models or guidance there. But when Kathy reached out and showed me that, I looked into it. I looked into it a lot. And I embraced it with a full passion that's part of my nature. Soup to nuts. Read everything I could about Leo Biscaglia, which led me down a path of Earl Nightingale and a bunch of other people. And I started to construct the damage, reconstruct the damage that was done to me. It took me about six years. During that time, I lost some of the weight, but I still pretty big guy by most definitions. And I was about 21 years old and most of the damage was healed. By this time I decided I'd put myself through school and I did and I went on to college and I hold two degrees, one in economics and one in finance. And from there on I said I have to do something about my weight. This is a pretty serious problem. Because I know that it didn't stop me from my day to day stuff I wanted to do but long term, 600 pounds, that's three people. And I got a frame built for one. It just doesn't work. So I worked to reduce my weight. I did it all. I did everything society said. I got a physical trainer. She was one of the, you, know, you guys have seen like the biggest loser, little Jillian Michaels chick that's all like, ah, ah, ah. I had one. Hired her. I was 26 years old. She's like, you're cheating. I know you're cheating. I'm like, I'm not cheating. Man, look, I want to lose weight. I'm the fat guy. You're like the perfect body woman. Why would I want to not lose my weight? So what I learned was that Working out wasn't just the answer, so I became very discouraged by that because that's what everybody told me is how you're going to lose weight. So I proceeded now at that point to put more weight back on. I got down about 400 pounds or something, and I started putting back on over the next seven years. I get involved in my first marriage. I decided I'm going to become this white knight because I shouldn't have married her, but by any definition, it was completely dysfunctional. Everything I knew about psychology told me it was wrong, but I had a life lesson yet to learn that, you know, you can't save anybody. You have to save yourself, and then they have to choose to save themselves. You can help them, but they have to choose that. No matter what after you do, you're not going to pull them out of the water unless they want to pull themselves out. So that's where my first marriage taught me a lot of lessons. So I moved on from it. I made mistakes, and I always tell anybody, I make lots of them, I just don't repeat them. It's a big difference there. 
And uh, so I went on and learned from that. Well, by this time, I had already grown back up to over 500 pounds. Remember, I did the workout thing. I followed that. And I said, well, now I just got to control my diet. Eat nothing but low carbs and do this stuff like this, and it's going to work. Yeah, it didn't work too good either. Because there's a metabolic process of stuff that changes in you once you're over 100 pounds. And if you Google it, it starts under Syndrome X back in the mid-90s. And now it's known as metabolic resistance and insulin resistance. And there's a whole series of this. They're really starting to understand how your body fights to lose the weight. So I had gastric bypass surgery. Went from over 500 pounds down to about 300 pounds, or about the size I am now, and never got any thinner. Didn't know why. It stopped. So again, I was frustrated, and I was like, man, what in the heck am I missing? I'm doing something wrong. Because I had other guys go in. They started out my size, went down to like 150 pounds, skinny as they'd want to be and whatever, healthy weights and whatnot. But I didn't have that option. It didn't work with my body. I didn't give up. So if anything my life's taught me, I, I don't give up. There was one time I crossed the line once. I gave up. I haven't since. And that's it. I was ready to give up the one time. There again, remember one mistake, don't repeat it after that, yeah. So I went on and realized after doing some research, and I'm older, I'm 40 years old, and I put back on some of the weight that I'd lost from the surgery even, I was like, there's gotta be something else I'm missing. So I started to research the whole paleo and primal way of eating, how that our body's actually not even designed to eat grains. It doesn't know how to process grains, let alone the processed sugars that everyone's on the bandwagon about now. That's only one piece of the equation, and you're not going to ever solve it until then. So I adopted that as a lifestyle in February, and I've lost almost 80 pounds since. I'd recommend that to anybody with your weight challenges of whatever size. The weight aside, go learn about it. And you're going to see that there's athletes that have been living on this high-carb diet, but they've been really high output in energy and still having tremendous damage gone inside their body to their organs, their joints, and its inflammation. It all came about because of this eating that we've been told by the, the authorities at large that this is the way you need to eat. Regardless, we have decades in history of past proof. If you go look at people that before America started, the American Heart Association told you how to eat and the government gave you their food pyramid and all this other crap, people were thin and fit. They have these crazy degenerative diseases that we have now. These come from a poor diet because ultimately at the end of the day, 80% of what you are is determined by what you eat. And it's a crazy statement to think about, but you know, muddle it and learn about it and go out there and Google it and find out. Because we have the ability to access information today to teach ourselves things that has never been able to be done before. We're on a, on a precipice, actually, of information overload, some would say. But, but that being said, I did all that. And I'm in the process of changing my life. I'm in the process of taking control of it in that aspect. I didn't have a problem with the rest of the stuff before, back from when I was 15. I mean, we went on. I, I've been vice president of a bank. I've actually served in capacity where I've managed hundreds of millions of bucks of other people's money. I've done a lot of stuff. I served as chair of the party. I've done quite a few things. So you can do that and even be that of whatever size because it's about choice and taking direction with your life. And that's all that I would tell any of you that's listening to the story of mine today. You have a choice and you will always have a choice. Every day your feet hit the ground, you have a choice. You have a choice to be an optimist about your life or a pessimist. It is a choice. And I don't care where your circumstance is in life, you have a choice. You may never be an NBA basketball player and you may want to do that. That's fine. It doesn't mean that you can't actually maybe be a coach on the NBA. Right? So it's all about a choice, though, and it's all what you choose to do. And from the very beginning of day one to the day you're in the grave, all your choices surmount to the life you live today. Nobody else. The government, none of them. It's all on you. It sucks. I know everyone tells you that it's somebody else's fault. Our government at large tells you. The media tells you. It's not. When you wake up tomorrow, it's your fault that you're not where you want to be in life. Nobody else. Sucks to hear that. It's tough love. I get it. No one likes to say it. I get that too, but that's the reality of it. When you wake up tomorrow and you don't like the fact you're in your mom's basement and, or you don't like the fact that your dad's a jerk and you put up with it, you allow that to happen. Nobody else does. Your spouse is crazy. You allow that to happen. You have to take control of your life. Your life is your own. That's all you get. You have nothing else which comes back to the libertarian philosophy that it is your life. You are the sole guardian, protector, and keeper of your sovereign state. That is it. Nobody else. Responsibility, and as in Spider-Man, great power comes great responsibility, right? So that being said, my comic book quote for all the comic geeks out there. But 
that's where we are and that's what you need to decide as an individual, as a human with sentient ability. And for those that are religious, I can go to the fact of that God told you he gave you the ability to choose. One of the first things he dictates. So how you want to look at it, it's all over the walls. You look in the mirror and there's nobody else but you at the end of the day. That's it. And what happens, what I have found, that if you actually lead from a position of strength, conviction, and courage, and you go where others don't want to go, oddly enough, people will follow you either in support or they'll just follow you because they're like, oh, this guy's got a better idea than I got. I'll go this way because I haven't figured out a difference between a tree and a shrub. He knows the difference. I'll follow him. And you'll get support. You'd be surprised how much support you can get. That all fits in the same piece, though. Back to being a libertarian, back to individual choices, back to self-love, back to self-recognition. It's all together. One cannot be without the other. I'll finish with saying this. Gandhi had a great quote. He referenced the fact, and it was in context, he was talking about how business leaders, back in his time even, would try to be one thing in public and perfectly in private be a different person. You can't do that. They're one. Business, personal life, it's all one because it's you because you're the only one operating the ship. So be an authentic person, be true to who you are, pursue what is your passion, and live your life that way. And that's all I got to say. So peace and love to everybody that matters to you. So how do you think your environment that you grew up in contributed to your psychological makeup in a way that that led you to, to, I don't know if this is accurate, but turn to food as as an escape or or a treatment or to have the attitude, whatever it was, that got you up to 600 pounds originally? Okay. So one of the easiest ways to give that as a contribution is all the people that came in drugged out in my house when I was a kid and I watched the drugs degeneratively destroy them. Not over 20 years, a year, two years. My mom, this one guy, she called him Crazy Larry and Larry showed up. He was hooked on pills because back in the 70s, pills were the thing. I grew up in the 70s, remember I'm 40. And uh, back in the 70s, pills were the thing. So he was hooked on all kinds of Percocets and Papa, I don't even know all of them. I really don't, I have no idea. But I know he consumed them all, and over the course of two years, he was dead in that time. And there's a history of people like that that my mom knew as I was a kid. So I had first-hand experience that, yeah, drugs do kill, but guess what? They choose to do them. They were still illegal. They're still illegal to consume just like they are today. So it doesn't matter. So I had a first-hand lesson that people are going to choose to do what they want to do. Just like I chose to eat a bunch of spaghetti at 3 in the morning or a bunch of other crappy welfare food that I had in the house because my life was shitty and my parents were just despondent and not there and, and absolutely wrecks as people to even take care of a kid. They had no business. So would you say it was, it was a combination of both the hopelessness of your situation as well as the examples that were being set for you? I would say, yeah, a combination for sure. And I'd even go one step further is that I could never bring myself to do the drugs because i seen the damage firsthand. I'd have to be blind to say that I didn't. So, okay, I thought, well... Food. I mean, at least you feel good. You get that big serotonin release. You have a bowl of pasta. You're like, oh, I feel fuzzy. I at least feel better because I want to cry, and crying's not helping. And that's what I did a lot as a kid. I'd ball in buckets in my pillow, and that didn't work. So I'm like, I needed something, and I couldn't bring myself to go out and do any type of drugs. So that's why I had. I had a refrigerator open 24 hours a day full of the worst food that the government could provide you. Although I have to tell you that, for the record, the government cheese is pretty badass. <laughs> but... Still, all the rest of the stuff, really cheap cuts of meat. They were poorly, poor and fat and everything else. I mean, I could go on, the crap. Bulk food that you eat that's pasta because you get a welfare check. Now, my parents, my mom was able-bodied. She could have got up and took direction. She didn't. My father, he was ill. He was literally mentally ill. He's definitely one of the people that the system should have snatched up and put somewhere. And it, and it didn't. The VA just sent him home with pills. And he was a veteran? He sure was. Korean War. And they sent him home with pills, didn't take care of him, and he was very sick. He had bipolar disorder, a schizophrenia, and, mani- and manic outbursts, both, um, well, negative and violent, as well as, you know, oh, hooray, the world's perfect. I just cut my arm off. So he had, like, both ends of it all the time. So you didn't know who you had and you were dealing with, kind of depended. So that kind of environment, coupled with the fact the only outlet I had, remember, well, for a kid, blue-collar neighborhood, everything else, had the refrigerator. That was it. Because food can be used like a drug. So like anything can be used as a drug. Because if you're, if you're being an untrue to yourself person, you can use anything to put yourself in a state of denial 
of dealing with whatever it is. People use sex. Some people use an addiction to gambling. Some people use an addiction to politics. <laughs> and society uses government itself. So how did you become a libertarian? I have to tell you, that goes back to my, so my economics degree is in Austrian economics. I attended Northwood University, classically trained Austrian economist. So I was my second year in class, and this guy came to speak, his name was Harry Brown. Harry Brown is renowned for many people in the party. They know who he is. He got a lot of recognition when he ran. He ran a very good campaign in circuit and made a lot of contacts. When he ran for president. That's correct. And uh, so he came and spoke at school. And he's telling me about the Federal Reserve Bank and how they're going to shut it down. And remember, I'm finance degree in economics. So you can't shut it down. How's the banking system going to work? What do you mean? This is crazy talk. You know what happened in the, before we had this? It was nuts. No, actually, before this big competition, the banks actually competed for your, your deposits. And it wasn't a big, well, it wasn't just one big monopoly and where there was four people in control or however may sit on the board for the Fed. I think it's 12. But anyway, it wasn't that. It was many banks with many boards, with many people, with many different agendas. So actually, you had a very competitive space, which was pretty awesome. Well, he came and spoke. And I was all ears and I was all kinds of questions after. And I was like, this party, I get it. Why do I get it? Well, because I get the choices I made to be sitting here in class attending a school where it's 14000 bucks a year and uh, I came as a welfare kid and got in on my brains and all these other kids around me are wealthy and successful parents and I came from the, the projects, for lack of another word, right? So I connected at that point. I understood it. And it understood me. And ever since then, to this day, I've had only had one job in my life where it wasn't strictly I was paid as I earn it. Um, and that was when I was young, right out of college. But before that, didn't have any of that. Everything I've ever done there and after, it's always been a commission job. Because guess what in the commission world? In commission world, which everybody says sucks, no. You have to be competitive. You have to be on point to deliver your message. All of that, it all fits in that space. It all fits in libertarian philosophy. It's all there. It's succinct. It's complete. And like I said, in 1992 when Harry came, it was like an epiphany for me on an intellectual point for politics and everything else. So how did you make the connection from the economics and the banking and the message of Austrian economics to personal responsibility and taking charge of your own health? Well, it all comes back down to you only get one you on your, on your time around the globe, and that's it. So... I had to make a decision like anybody else in life when you're facing something. You have to either cho make a choice. It's like I did when I was 15 if I wanted to keep kicking my rocks around. But I wasn't later. It's just a matter you had to make a choice. So at that time when I was in school and I was learning about Austrian economics, I didn't even know about it. didn't even know anything about it. And here I am in this class, and this guy, Dr. Dale Haywood, introduced his 12-cell matrix. And that was my first classic introduction to Austrian economics about personal property and limited government and free enterprise. And it, it was another moment of an epiphany where I'm like, I get this. I get the importance of it. And then we didn't even talk about religion and the fact that, you know, my, my father would use God as an abusive point and tell me how God's going to kill us all today. And I only bring this up as a cross-reference because I learned also the importance of letting people explore religion and spirituality because I was, as a kid, told that I should be a Baptist and every Catholic I knew was going to go to hell. And anybody else who wasn't a Baptist, well, they're an abomination too. And I started to explore that piece in my life. I did that at the age of 13. Walked down to my pastor and I said, um, I don't understand. I have some questions. And he says, well, just read the Bible and go, go sit down. Oh, no, no, no. I have some more questions. And he wouldn't answer them. So I started reading. Remember? I'm that kind of guy. I find it. I'm going to read it. I'm going to learn. And you're going to find out. I know a lot about it pretty quick. So I started asking him more poignant questions and he couldn't answer. I realized I'd reached a turning point in that type of structure. And that's what it libertarianism embraces, allows you to make that choice, to make that turning point. So you can even say before I even made the choice to be alive or dead, you know, I'd already started my journey even then. The seeds were being planted in my own brain based on the most connected thing, which is your spirituality, which I recommend everybody practice in some form because it's all part of about balancing yourself as a human being. So would it be a stretch to say that libertarianism saved your life? It'd be a stretch to say it, probably, but I mean, because it was Kathy McKenney reaching out to save my life. And before that, it was my choice, above all else, to not end my life that saved my life. But it was someone who said, like I said before, they'll reach out, people will help you, but they can't make you do it. You have to choose. 
So I chose, you can choose, you know, and then from there it's the world's a whole open book of all kinds of opportunities. Like if you notice up here, I have a button on my lapel. I'm the president of the Optimist Club for my town in Brighton, Michigan. And uh, the Optimist Club, they have a whole creed, which I should be able to recite and I can't, but uh, offhand, but um, I recommend you Google that too. And uh, if you can actually incorporate lots of pieces of that creed to your daily psyche, you'd be amazed how it would change your perception of many things that you encounter in life. So 